subject, but it seems to be that at least in this room, the long winter of uh, quantum field theory is about to give way, if only briefly, to the spring of uh, classical field theory. <laughs> and, uh, the magician who will do this for us is uh, not Gandalf, but uh, someone with grey hairs. <laughs> So thanks a lot for the nice introduction, beautiful introduction, the f beautiful I have had, <laughs> most beautiful I have had. Um, yeah, usually uh, I, I perhaps would like the, to, to thank the organizers for the nice conference and for the opportunity to give a talk today. Yeah, usually one doesn't start a talk by asking forgiveness, but I should ask forgiveness for two things. The first is that I didn't bring any former suit, so I'm wearing like a, a member of an heavy metal group. So <laughs> this is, <laughs> so please forgive me for that. And the second forgiveness is that uh, in my talk there will never appear, almost never appear the word quantum. Huh? <laughs> so I'm a little bit ashamed to present you something for classical field theory on classical space-time. It's not even the space-time is quantum. So just <laughs> so some some you may even wonder why doing these things today huh? in the age of quantum field theory on quantum space-time strings or whatever. I think that there is still something to say, especially if you take. Uh, if you have in mind the algebraic pers perspective of doing field theories. So what I would like to present today is a joint work with Klaus Fredenhagen and Pedro Lauritz and Ribeiro. And uh, I ask it for, for, for forgiveness, but uh, a partial thing is that you see that uh, looks like a mistake here. <laughs> uh, should ask forgiveness three times? No, this is because I'm much ahead of time. <laughs> so that's the. <laughs> so I'm like the old ladies who turn failures into <laughs> something positive, you know. <laughs> so um, this is the outline of the talk. I would like to give some brief introduction, and then shape the, the, the talk into much in the algebraic uh, uh, flavor, meaning uh, separating kinematical structure from dynamical structures. Then some, of course, consequences of what I would say, and then uh, uh, a little bit of conclusions. So, classical field theory on classical space-time. Uh, among our group, this didn't uh, had much attention. As far as I remember, at least, uh, there, are, there is only the paper on, CM, on communication mathematical physics, uh, which John Roberts and Leyland uh, published in 78, which had to do with net cohomology in classical field theory. And then more, m a little bit more recently, uh, the paper uh, of Dutch and Fredenhagen uh, in 2003. Much of what I will say is or some spirit is already contained in this last paper. Huh? But there are also some differences. So typically, uh, mathematicians or mathematical physicists study classical field theory by uh, using geometrical techniques. So mainly, you know, uh, all these people, Weinstein, Marston, Kijowski, they use a multisymplectic approach. Huh? Phase spaces and other things like this. There are also mathematicians like Vinogradov who uses algebraic geometry and topology uh, with a certain amount of uh, good results. Um, physicists like to uh, deal with other methods no geometry, essentially no geometry at all, but using the functional methods which are very uh, near to then to be used for, for 
uh, for the path integral in quantum field theory. So in, the, in, the, in these functional methods, uh, usually one thinks uh, of an infinite dimensional generalization of Lagrangian mechanics, eh? of course, heuristically. Sometimes this can be, has been made rigorous by mainly using Banach space techniques. Uh, we want to do something different, but uh, let me just let appear this catchy phrase. Uh, uh, classical field theory, you will see that it's not te so terribly infinite dimensional. Huh? So, uh, the heuristic is there, but uh, it is infinite dimensional, but not so much. At least if you take the algebraic perspective. So the aim, of course, is what I was set, uh, saying is to give a new, a fresh look uh, of interacting classical field theory. Um, and it's strongly biased by some structures which appeared in perturbative quantum field theory in recent years. Uh, and I showed you, uh, I already told you about the paper of Dutch, Fredenhagen, and then the other papers, especially, uh, sorry, especially this one, which will appear in Advanced Theoretical Mathematical Physics September, October two this year. And then this is, uh, uh, lectures not on physics, uh, there are some lectures uh, which also will appear soon, but uh, these papers are already on, on the archives, so you can find there. So the setting of what I will be talking about is I will deal with the easiest example, which is uh, scalar field, real scalar field, and of course the geometry is always been told uh, several times, especially today, uh, consider globally hyperbolic space-times eh? with generic dimension, but fix it. So, let us start with the perspective of algebraic quantum f uh, algebraic uh, uh, setting. We know, usually we uh, had to decide what are the states, what are the observables. Eh? Uh, as a reminder, in classical mechanics, states are points on a manifold, huh? which is called configuration space. And then the observables are use, usually taken to be the smooth functions over this configuration space. And moreover, they have also additional structure, especially if you want to introduce dynamics. We have a Poisson structure on that. And this is the structure that we want to imitate uh, also for the classical field theory. So we need to single out configuration observa and observables to, have to deal with the kinematics and the Poisson structure for the, for the dynamics. So let me start with the configuration space. Um, yeah, we can take as a motivation this, the case of classical mechanics, the finite dimensional. So, um, our favor favorite choice is uh, the one in which the configuration space is uh, just the space of all smooth functions on the globally hyperbolic space-time with the usual Frechet topology. Uh, and I will use the script E as a simplified notation for that. So this is what corresponds to what uh, corresponds to what physicists uh, call the off-shell setting, in the sense that I'm not considering solutions of the equations of motions, which up to now I didn't even uh, consider at all. Now, as far as the observables are concerned, I would like to use. Uh, the notion of nonlinear functional. So, uh, what I will say has a lot of overlap with what uh, Klaus has already told you on the first day. Yeah? So, observables in general, uh, but I want to give you a step by step uh, definition. Uh, so, I will sort of pedagogical. Uh, introduction to, the, to this thing. So we have nonlinear functionals on the, spa on the configuration space and uh, it takes real values 
and uh, the space of all such functionals under this pointwise product here uh, certainly makes uh, an associative community algebra. But in any case, not much things can be said at this level generally. One needs to make further restrictions to have good uh, working properties. And I would like to separate the restriction in two parts. One is as to deal with the support properties and the other with the regularity properties. So as far as the support properties are concerned, we define the support of the, of the functional much uh, uh, with a definition which is very near to what uh, is used in uh, distribution theory, in, this, in spite of the fact that these are nonlinear functionals. Huh? So this is self-explaining, I think it's. Um, and of course, this, this support has uh, nice properties, and of course, has the properties that you expect as a support for the, for instance, for the, for the sum is the union, and therefore the product is just intersection. And uh, further requirement that this all function has to, has to have compact support on space-time. So one other requirement, restriction, is what uh, we call additivity which means that the function has to satisfy this property here, written over here, whenever the elements of configuration space, phi 1, phi 2, and phi 3, are such that the intersection of the first and the third is empty. So this replaces the shift-like typical properties of distributions. Huh? It's a sort of weak replacement for linearity, and this allows to do what the shift property does for the, for the distribution, to bracket, bracket a distribution into small pieces. And indeed, we have a okay, very simple result uh, that says that uh, any additive and compactly supported function can be decomposed into a finite sum of such functionals with arbitrarily small support. So it's amusing to... Uh, to notice that uh, this uh, notion of additivity goes back to the very early times of, the, of mathematics of the last century. Eh? So Kantorovich gave it first in 38. But it appears several times in mathematics. Eh? Although it's not a mainstream notion, it seems, uh, seems to appear in several places. For instance, you find it uh, uh, in the fourth <coughs> volume of Gerfanschilov for, for well, perhaps in the multiplicative sense, but it's there. It is used several times. So as far as the regularity is concerned, remember that the roadmap says that we have to define the observable as some smooth functions. Huh? Uh, we would like then to define what is a smooth observable. But just remember that the configuration space is not a Banach space. It's a Frisché space. And the usual notion of differentiability are a little bit different. Nothing that, uh, that cannot be uh, carefully uh, defined and used. Eh? So uh, perhaps it's not also this notion is not, it's not terribly mainstream uh, uh, in mat for, uh, for mathematicians, but mathematical physicists already know it, if at least they read the lectures note in uh, infinite dimensional Lie group uh, given by Milner on Lesouche, in which he uses this notion already, uh, even more general. So the definition is very simple, a derivative of functional, uh, directional derivative is uh, at a point with respect to a certain uh, direction is just uh, okay I gave different equivalent way of uh, writing this derivative is when this uh, limit exists whenever this exists this is the deri derivative of phi with respect to this direction then the function is said to be differentiable at this point if uh, 
the derivative exists in any direction and continuously differentiable if it is differentiable for all direction and all evaluation points. And moreover, the derivative as a map is jointly continuous from e times e to r. Then when this happens, the function is said to be in C1 from e to r, valued in r. Um, so as a map, uh, uh, this derivative is uh, typically non-linear at the evaluation point and linear in the direction. One can, of course, by using the iteration, uh, define also the I or the derivatives. Uh, what is really important is, is the, the fundamental results of, uh, of uh, basic calculus are still valid. Eh? So you have Leibniz rule, chain rule, the fundamental theorem of calculus, the Schwartz lemma, and so forth. Um, well, so coming back to to the observables, we would just give this definition. Eh? So observables are all possible functionals such that they are smooth, so they are infinitely differentiable in this sense, and they kth order derivatives are distribution of compact support. However, we would like also to put other structures on this algebra. For instance, we would like to put uh, Poisson structures and proving Jacobi identity, other things. And, uh, but this involves uh, multiplication of distributions. So this is not yet enough. We need to put further restrictions to allow multiplication of distributions. Huh? So on the other restrictions are just restrictions on the wavefront sets. Uh, there are several possibilities. I will tell you just two, the most relevant for, for, for this talk and for, the, for our purposes. The first is the definition of local functionals, which is just a smooth functional in which the support of any derivative is in, is, uh, sits inside the diagonal. This is the thin diagonal in the uh, m to the n, so the space-time, appropriate space-time over that. And the wavefront set is, should be orthogonal to the tangent bundle of the diagonal, seen as a sub-bundle of the cotangent bundle. So a typical example is what you would expect. Eh? Take uh, some uh, function of compact support, and uh, okay, this is the uh, jet. Prolongation. Pardon? Prolongation. The prolongation, yes. So, okay, you, you just take a certain number, a polynomial here with, uh, of the, the field, uh, and certain finite number of derivatives. Huh? So this would be a local function. But uh, the local function, I have the nasty thing that this, they do not make an algebra. If you multiply two, these are on different points, and so this is not a local anymore. So you get out of that. So one needs a little bit, uh, to, to enlarge a little bit this class, and the class which is preferred sort of minimal enlargement is what can be called micro local functionals micro causal functionals whatever doesn't matter much the names we will call it this smooth real smooth observable these are all smooth functionals sorry for uh, for which this restriction hold. So the wavefront set on the nth or the derivative should not uh, touch this, uh, uh, this sub, uh, subset in cotangent bundle. So this just amount to say yeah, that the n momenta inside this wavefront set are never all together in the forward light cones or all together in the backward light cones. Huh? So this should not happen. Now, using this, uh, this new notion, one checks that you can multiply the distribution because this is exactly the purpose of this restriction. Eh? 
Um, let me then call the complement of this set here and the cotangent bundle by gamma n with a warning that this is an open cone. Huh? This is a warning to those which knows what is microlocal analysis and these things. Huh? And then the algebra, the observable algebra of the microlocal functions, I will call it uh, the script f of m. Now, coming to the results of the first part. The first is that uh, in the smooth case, for, so for smooth functionals, uh, local functionals are just equivalent to the additive functionals. This was a little bit of a, su a, su a surprise. Eh? So uh, you just can forget uh, the difference between additivity and locality. They are just the same. And another more important result is that uh, the algebra of observables is a nuclear a sequentially complete topological algebra. So I would like just to sketch why it is nuclear. You consider the topology on this as the initial topology with respect to all these maps here. Huh? So it's the weakest, topology, weakest locally convex topology for which all these maps are continuous. Then uh, uh, the topology here would be already nuclear if the distribution spaces uh, were, were nuclear. Huh? But this is so only when this is a closed cone. But in our case this is open, so one needs a, a little bit more work. In any case what uh, comes out is that this is the uh, countable inductive limit of nuclear spaces, and since then this is a countable inductive limit by the um, properties of which were pioneered by Grothendieck, so these permanent properties of nuclear spaces, this is also a nuclear space, and since any initial topology on nuclear space is nuclear, then this, the, the algebra of functional is nuclear as well. I will not tell you why sequential complete is another construction for brevity. I, I would skip that. So it is here that uh, now I remind you the fact that classical field theory not, is not so terribly infinite dimensional because it's a nuclear space. So it's very near to be finite dimensional. Eh? So it's infinite dimensional but not so drastically infinite dimensional. So just a summary, we introduce the configuration space, the observables are just the nonlinear functional with appropriate restrictions on the wavefront set of the derivatives. So all wavefront sets should sit inside these open cones. Then we have notion of additivity, uh, additive functional, local functional, but actually in the smooth case these are equivalent and the algebra has nice topological properties. I would just also uh, like to remark that so far this is just the cinematica, kinematical structure, so no dynamics appear. And this looks like uh, the property we have in quantum field theory uh, in the uh, local von Neumann algebra case, uh, that we always have a 3 1 factor, uh, in, irrespective of the theory of the dynamics or whatever. Uh. So each time that you have a classical field theory in this algebraic sense, this is a nuclear space, topological space. So let me then come to the dynamical part. Uh, to discuss about the dynamics, I need the notion of Lagrangian. This was uh, uh, already written in this paper. So the notion of Lagrangian, uh, uh, also Klaus, if I remember well, told you something. It's uh, just an action function. It's just a map from test functions to the local functional such that these two properties hold. The support of this object here, this is, you see, L of F is just uh, a local functional, so an element here, is inside the support of the test function, and additivity holds for the test functions. It's not, I'm not requiring additivity, of course, as yes, members here, we, we, this would be automatic. <laughs> So whenever, of course, these, uh, the two test functions do not overlap. Eh? 
So a typical example is just what you expect. Take, uh, this will be the leading example also for what I will say later. Huh? So this is the Lagrangian density and then this is the action functional. So let me discuss a little bit then on the dynamics. Uh, we consider a test function which is identically one on a relatively compact uh, open subspace time of our space time, then the Lagrange equation, Euler-Lagrange equation are just written over there. And you see one restricts to the uh, relatively compact subspace time, then on this space time f is equal to one, and then these are the usual equations. Since n is arbitrary, this equation would all everywhere in the space time, okay? What is will be important uh, Next uh, is uh, the linearization of the field equation around a certain background. Any arbitrary background, actually. This means that we have to compute the second order derivative of this Lagrange, of the Lagrangian. Eh? Again, taking the same trick as before. Uh, okay, this was uh, related to the example. Eh? Uh, the example I gave before. Again, in the example, we would have this object here. Huh? So you see that this is the, again, this sort of differential operator. And uh, this case would be essentially obvious. But in the general case, we have to require that this uh, differential operator is a strictly hyperbolic operator, uh, which have retarded and advanced green functions, uniquely determined on any globally hyperbolic space-time. So the dynamics in this off-shell setting is uh, introduced by looking to somethi into something uh, different. We, I will not use the equation of motions. Huh? I will use some other kind of dynamics. The dynamics that we will use is something very similar to what has been uh, what is done in quantum mechanics, like uh, the Muller intertwiners. Eh? So we consider the first order derivative of a certain Lagrangian or action as a map from configuration to distributions, and then we call retard the Muller operator as certain endomorphism in configuration space for which you see intertwines the two Euler-Lagrange operator of, the, of two different actions. So this is the intertwining relation with a certain retardation property, which is written over here. Hmm? So the main task is the following. We would like, of course, to construct examples of these Mellor maps. So consider L2 as fixed Lagrangian, L1 as this Lagrangian plus a perturbation. Lambda is a real parameter. Then the main task is to prove existence of uniqueness of this map around any possible configuration. I'm not doing perturbation around the vacuum, so phi equal to zero, any possible configuration. This is quite different from what you find in literature, even for classical phi theory. Usually, things are done around the zero background, so around the vacuum. So the main theorem is that this map exists and are unique in an open neighborhood of the test function of the interaction part. So I'm, I'm very brief about these things, uh, um, especially for for the result, the result is really to the force in R function analysis. And can't give you any details, this would require talk in itself, uh, but just the idea. So um, consider the, the, the definition that we had before, the intertwining relation, the retardation, and write, uh, we would like to write down a differential version of this, talk, or this, or this uh, stuff. Uh, writing up a sort of flow equation in lambda, in this real parameter. So define phi of lambda as the image under this map of the configuration phi. And then if you take the derivative of the relation before, 
gives you that, that, uh, that equation here. So the second order functional derivative evaluated over phi of lambda plus this, all these terms here. Maybe there is some lambda missing somewhere, but. And then we, uh, by applying the retardation property and strong hyperbolicity, we can use uh, the retarded propagator just to, uh, to erase this term, essentially, right? Because this is uh, the retardation of propagator is a solution of this differential operator by definition. And then this equation is written down in this form here. Then this appears to be an ordinary differential or, uh, equation with respect to, to, to this parameter on a free shape space. As, I, as you know, if you are in Banach space, everything under some assumption, everything works quite well, straightforwardly. In free shape space, this is really, really a mess. Um, so one has to use, of course, uh, much more elaborated technique. And essentially, these techniques are um, using implicit function theorems of Nash and Moser. Huh? So, but the procedure is essentially, in a very brief term, you break up the perturbation into very small pieces. Essentially, you go on RD, but still with the uh, with the metric of the global hyperbolic space-time, so it's still curved, it's not flat. And use the composition, uh, and then uh, solve uh, the implicit function theorem for, or use the implicit function theorem to give a solution to this equation via a priori estimate, so essentially uh, for, for the retarded propagator here and uh, Tame, acid, uh, tame energy estimate, essentially, and then use a composition property to glue again back these this pieces that you have to have the full proof on, on space-time. Um, part of this, uh, um, of this result is in, on the poster outside, uh, so if you want to look a little bit more in detail, so do these things. Now, Coming to definition of the Poisson structure for classical field theory. Then, if one uses this, uh, the construction of the Mellon map, one really can give a rigorous construction of pi s brackets. I would like to avoid this altogether. I just give you a definition, straightforward definition. Uh, the pi s bracket is just uh, defined over here. It's just, you see, that uh, on certain action functional two uh, f uh, observables have the Poisson bracket written as the first functional derivative and compose it with the commutator function, the advanced minus retarded uh, green functions, okay? So one proves that uh, <coughs> these pi s brackets satisfy all the axiom for being a real Poisson bracket, namely Jacobi identities and Leibniz identities. And this entails that uh, the Poisson structure uh, is defined in our sense as a triple, the observable, an action functional, and this pi s bracket here. Um, of course, uh, uh, by giving the pi s bracket, uh, we have an additional the algebra structure, even infinite dimensional. Huh? So let me give you <coughs> the summary of this dynamical part. It's, uh, we introduce the generalized Lagrangians, uh, which lead to hyperbolic equation, but this is uh, more uh, in the sense that the second order functional is an hyperbolic differential, strongly hyperbolic differential operator. And uh, of course, you can have all, possi all possibility, linear equation, semi-linear equation, quasi-linear equation, whatever you want. Then we introduce a dynamic, which is just the offshore dynamics, in the sense of these Muller maps. Then also the Poisson structure via pi s brackets. I should also say that this notion of pi s bracket is already in the papers of Dutch and Fredenhagen. So 
um, they were the first to really check uh, the, the, the stuff uh, many years ago. So let me also now pass to some consequences of these two structures, kinematical and dynamical structure, besides the existence of the Milner map. Eh? <clears throat> so we found that locally you can uh, prove the existence of uniqueness of this sort of maps for any possible um, variation, uh, yeah, for any possible interaction, perturbation. Um, but this has strong implication for the Poisson structure. So I'll tell you the first one, which is the Darbu theorem, essentially. So one proves that these maps are canonical transformation for the Poisson structure. So they intertwine the two Poisson structures associated to L and the perturbed L, like that. In particular, this allows us to put even off shell this Poisson bracket in normal form. Huh? So it, this is a sort of locally background independent functional Darboux theorem. And to prove this, you, you need uh, something very similar to what it is done, of course, in the Nash Moser stuff situation. Moreover, one can define subspaces of the observable. Namely, one can define, for instance, a subspace of all functionals which vanish on solutions. Now I'm using the solutions. Eh? And uh, one can prove that this is an ideal, but uh, with respect to the pointwise product, this is obvious because they are zero. If the if phi is a solution of the equation of motion, but furthermore, they are also ideal in the, for the Poisson structure. So it's really a Poisson ideal. So I give you the idea for that. So just uh, consider phi to be a solution of this equation of motions and consider a one parameter family of functions uh, on configuration space such, such that at, ten, uh, at, at t equal to zero, it is the given solution and that they satisfy this equation here. Then, uh, of course, uh, this is for, would be for any g. Yeah? Then provided the solution of this uh, equation exists, it is indeed also a solution of the equation of motions. Indeed, uh, it is, uh, uh, sorry, for t equal to zero, this is the solution, the started solution, the starting solution, and if you derive this relation, you get L2 times this one, this object here, but since this is the fundamental solution of L2, then this is zero. Huh? Uh, this means, of course, that the functional f, which we started with, also vanish along any of these elements of this, uh, this one parameter family of functions. Now then if we take the derivative with respect to t of this, of this object, we just get, by using this relation, just the Poisson bracket, and the Poisson bracket uh, at zero just because this is zero. Okay? So this proves that, of course, this, is, uh, this subspace of functionals is a Poisson idea because as vanishing Poisson bracket for, for solutions. And of course, to prove uh, that, this so, uh, that the solution for this equation exists, one uses again the same strategy as before for the <coughs> construction of the Miller map. So uh, then one can say something even more as far as the symplectic structure is concerned. Uh, one may characterize the center of the algebra by looking at the Casimir functionals. So, so these are all functionals f which vanish, f with f, which have Poisson bracket vanishing 
for all possible g and phi. So just the element with respect to the Poisson structure. So uh, what one can prove that these are generated by elements of this sort, or here, and phi here, these functions, these are test functions, a compact support, they should depend on phi also, and constant functional. So one may then quotient the algebra of, 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 of observables by the Poisson ideas or the Casimir ideas. Okay, this is an idea. The Casimir idea is an idea with respect to the Poisson structure, not, of course, with respect to the pointwise uh, product structure. Huh? Then the quotient, we can form at least two quotients. One is this one, which is uh, respect to the um, Poisson ideal, which would give the theory on shell. Huh? So this quotienting passes from off shell to off shell structures. Either uh, one can use the quotient with respect to the Casimirs, and this would give you a symplectic structure in the sense that now the Poisson bracket is not the generator anymore. Oh, so uh, since all the ideas are linear subspaces, they are nuclear by the permanence properties of Grothendieck, huh? uh, but they are also closed. Then when you take the quotient, all these, uh, all these quotients uh, remain the same nuclear class. Huh? So they, are, uh, they remain in the same topological class. They are remain uh, nuclear topological spaces. So one may then ask, where is the real algebraic structure, so the next structure. But this can be done by just restricting uh, the supports of the functionals, uh, to have functionals restricted uh, into uh, diamonds or whatever. But I would not uh, say much on this and pass to actually to the more modern form, which is the local equivalent uh, <coughs> fashion. Uh, this is because I, I wish also to, uh, I just want to tell you that the, all the construction can be made locally covariant. So far we use only one space-time, now we try, we try to use the factorial situation. So actually what results is that we have a functor from the category of manifold, which I like to call lock as locality category, uh, of course, as um, Chris and, uh, and Reiner said, these are just the same categories as they explained, so I will skip any detail. And the observable, of course, are um, F elements, which are just the algebra of observable we constructed before. Um, one can also use another category by, the, by using the Pierce brackets. To do that, we have to enlarge the meaning of, ge of the generalized Lagrangian. So, namely, I want to promote the Lagrangian to be natural transformations, which is something very natural. So, the natural Lagrangian are just natural transformation between these two functors. This is the functor that also Chris mentioned, the functor which associates to any space-time, the test function of compact support relative to, 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 to the space-time itself, and this is just the functor that I was defining before. So this means that we have a family of maps, so usual sort of Lagrangian, such that whenever you have an embedding between space-time, we have this condition, which is the naturality condition. So an important point, so you see that here, I'm defined, uh, I wrote this in brackets uh, just because this is not really the local function as I defined before. Actually, it turns out that if you consider this map with the additivity property uh, and the naturality property, together they say that this is a local. Component wise, these are automatically local functional. So you use additivity in the test function, the naturality properties, and then you just prove that this is a local functional. So local functional comes uh, for free in this context. 
then uh, using uh, the fact that the first order derivative, the Euler Lagrange uh, operator uh, is the equation of motions and the second functional derivative is a strictly hyperbolic uh, operator, uh, one endows this, uh, um, and one endows the uh, algebra with the pi s structure as before, we have just the uh, main theorem of this part that the, the functor f of L from the category of space time to those of nuclear Poisson algebra is satisfy all the axioms of local or locally covariant fields. Of course, the causality axiom is here in terms of the Poisson bracket. Eh? So let me make uh, more or less conclusive remarks. Um, actually, I can extend this construction to the case of tensor categories. Eh? Since uh, we have nuclear spaces and they behave well under tensor products. Mm? So I can extend this to, to this case. In this case, uh, of course, the, uh, uh, the categories here of Poisson Tensor Poisson, this is SF explaining. In the case of locality, the tensor category as uh, the structure that the tensor product of two space time is just a disjoint union. So you don't have, you don't deal anymore with the connected space time, but these connected pieces. Huh? And the embedding uh, admissible when two space time embeds into a third one, perhaps I should write something, I forgot to do that. Um, so an embedding M1, M2 into a third space-time is admissible when the image are space-like separated in the causality, of course, structure of the final space-time. Okay, <clears throat> so one can work out these things. Uh, I hope that they will appear in the, in the paper. Um, there is, however, one interesting point uh, which has to do with the fact that uh, we are uh, when we uh, use the Poisson ideas, we are using the equation of motions. Huh? Um, the important point is that, of course, uh, um, if we want to go to the on-shell theory, we know that, f because of factoriality, the ideas transform in this way when this is the embedding, isometric embedding. <coughs> if we quotient with respect to the structures, then the quotient is again a good functor. Eh? But uh, uh, due, to the, uh, f due to this relation, eh, which has to do with the uh, possibility that uh, in nonlinear hyperbolic equations you may have solution with a finite li uh, life uh, span, lifespan, then uh, it might be that the morphism is uh, not any more injective. So then it would be really interesting to check whether in this, uh, when we quotient, so in this structure, when we can prove the time slice axiom, uh, when we replace injectivity by surjectivity. Because for sure in the nonlinear case, this is, will never be injective due to this uh, to this uh, <coughs> to this relation, this means that you may have solutions here that cannot extend to the whole space eh? because of the blow up. Yeah. Okay. So um, just at the final consideration, um, I showed you that uh, one can really try to construct. Uh, with a certain success uh, using the algebraic ideas, classical field theory, even interacting classical field theory. So you can construct the kinematical structure and the 
dynamic structure via the Poisson, uh, Payer's Poisson brackets. <coughs> of course, uh, um, well, I forgot to mention that uh, much of what I said for sure works for the semi-linear case. So whenever you have uh, a first order Lagrangian, which means just contains first order derivative of the, of the, f of the, <coughs> of the configuration uh, elements. Uh, for the quasi-linear case, uh, uh, maybe this also works thanks to certain tools which have been uh, invented by Christo Dulu some years ago. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, Kleinerman, not Christodoulou, but they are almost equivalent sometimes. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is um, commutator vector field structures. Uh, so for sure, Kleinerman, thanks. Um, of course, an important point would be to make the ascension to gauge theories. Huh? And this requires further elements, so probably a classical BRS constructions, other things like this. Uh, even more ambitiously, of course, we would like to extend this construction to Einstein equation. As you um, may have noticed, perhaps I didn't say explicitly, but all the construction is always local, so around the support of the interaction. Um, this, of course, would need uh, even to dive into more complicated tools, which is paradifferential calculus. And maybe the last one is maybe uh, there would be some possibility to apply this sort of construction to, do, uh, to go beyond what Konsevich did uh, some years ago. Huh? He did it for finite dimensional Poisson structure. This is infinite dimension, but perhaps just because you can really construct explicitly, explicitly all this structure, maybe one can even try to do uh, this. Of course, this is just a hope. It's nothing concrete. And I think my talk is over. Thank you. Uh, is just the fields as natural transformation. This is 
what I, I would expect. Of course, I do not expect to have a local observer. It seems to be quite complicated stuff. Yeah. But of, for, for sure, we will have the fields as natural transformation. This, this is the old, but it needs to work it out. So we have to couple graphs to matter, and then the quantities built from the matter fields, this, these would be the observables. You could have, or you could have. Of course, nothing, no local structures can come from the ground. Now, could you, could you please uh, uh, speak up? Because you were only speaking, uh, I think that not many people outside a, a very narrow cone uh, heard you. Sorry, but I didn't understand. No, it's like a pure gravity of course, structures, because there's nothing to right. You have to couple to matter, and restrict the matter sector. Gravity, but uh, the non-restricted matter sector can speak about observable matters. Okay. I, 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 okay, I think that the, the, the discussion will go on for, for a very long time. So <laughs> I, at least I hope that it will. But once again, thank you very, very much for a very algebraic uh, uh, flavor, meaning uh, separating kinematical structure from dynamical structures, then some, of course, consequences of what I would say, and then uh, uh, a little bit of conclusions. So, classical field theory on classical space-time. Uh, among our group, this didn't distribution theory, in, this, in spite of the fact that these are non-linear functionals. Huh? So this is self-explaining, I think it's... Um, and of course, this, this support has uh, nice properties, and of course, as the su expect as a support for the, for instance, for the, for the sum is the union, and the, for the product is just intersection. And uh, further requirement that this all function has, have to, has to have compact support on space-time. So one other requirement